Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear listeners. A very good morning to my non-Muslim brethren. Let me start off. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'een. The incident that had such a powerful impact on the religious and political history of Islam is the tragic event of Sayyidina Imam Hussain's shahadat, his martyrdom. While it is extremely important to remember the sacrifice year on, it is also equally important for us to understand the message of Karbala and try to apply it to our lives. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, rahimallah, he says, Kulli yawme ashura, kulli arze Karbala. Every day is Ashura and every land is Karbala. Indeed. And beautifully said by Mawlana Muhammad Ali Jawhar, he says, Qatli Hussain asli me margaye yazid hai. Islam zinda hota hai har Karbala ke baad. The killing of Hussain is actually the death of Yazid. Islam is revived after every Karbala. Khwaja Mu'inuddin Chisti's powerful verses epitomizes the reverence and devotion of Muslims towards Sayyidina Hussain. Shah Shah Asta Hussain, Bad Shah Asta Hussain, Dine Asta Hussain, Dine Pana Asta Hussain, Sardad Nadad, Dasta Dar Daste Yazid, Hakka Kay Binaye La Ilaha Asta Hussain. King is Hussain, King is Hussain, religion is Hussain, the protector of religion is Hussain, who gave his head and not his hand to the hand of Yazid. Verily, Hussein is the foundation of La ilaha illallah. Never in history has the tragedy of Karbala evoked such emotion, such grief, and so much anger and such passion. No tragic incident that has occurred in this world caused has humanity to shed so much tears so profusely as this particular event. On the 10th of Muharram, 61 Hijrah, October the 10th, 680, in Karbala, present-day Iraq. Just less than 1,400 years have passed since the soul-stirring event in Islamic history. And still, the month of Muharram brings to the mind of every Muslim a vivid remembrance of the noble sacrifice offered by Sayyidina Imam Hussein ibn Ali bin Abu Talib, rahimallah. Just coming out of the month of Hajj, the month of sacrifice, the symbolic sacrifice of Ismail alayhi salam was actually the curtain raiser of the actual sacrifice of Sayyidina Hussein, the grandson of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That Sayyidina Hussein, who together with his brother is considered by the Prophet al Hassan wal Hussein, Sayyida Shabab Ahl al Jannah. Hassan and, and Hussein will be the leaders of the youth of paradise. And also, Hussein minni, says the Prophet Wa ana min Hussein, ahabb Allah man ahabb Husseinan. Hussein sibtum min al azbar. Sayyidina Hussein is from me, and I'm from Hussein. Allah loves whoever loves Hussein. Hussein is a sibt amongst the azbar. Sibt it means a great tribe, you know. And you'd have seen how many offspring have come from Sayyidina Hussein. The family of the Prophet, whom Allah invokes us through the Quran, Tell them, say, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I ask of you no reward except that you love my family. Yet, Sayyidina Hussein was deliberately and shamelessly martyred at the hands of those who considered themselves reading this ayah and claimed to be the followers of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and claimed to act in the name of Islam. Those who, like so many today, are prepared to kill and die in the name of Islam, yet they are unable to live by Islam. It is regarding this Quranic verse that Imam al-Shafi rahimallah wrote this beautiful poetry. Ya ala bayti rasulillahi hubbukum فرض من الله في القرآن أنزله 
كفاكم من عظيم القدر أنكم من لم يصلي عليكم لا صلاة له أو أهل البيت of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam love for you has been made obligatory for us by Allah as revealed in the Quran it is sufficient for your dignity that not sending salawat to you in the salah his prayers will not be accepted subhanallah Nabi alayhi salam says inni tarikun fikum ma in tamassaktum bi lan tadillu ba'di I am indeed leaving amongst you that which if you hold fast to them you shall not be misguided after me one of them is greater than the other the book of Allah which is a rope extended from the sky to the earth and my family, the people of my house, and they shall not split until they meet me at the Houd. فَانْذُرُوا كَيْفَ تَخْلُفُونِي فِيهِمَا So look at how you deal with them after me. It is commonly known that people most beloved to a person are his family and progeny. The following ayat was revealed in relation to the wives of the Prophet. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُكُمُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ مُرِّجِسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ Allah only wishes to rid you of spiritual filth, O members of the household, and to purify you thoroughly. But a hadith confirms that when this verse was revealed to Nabi alayhi salam, he took Sayyidatina Fatima, Sayyidina Hassan, Sayyidina Hussain, and Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhum under a shawl and made this dua, O oh Allah, they are also from my Ahlul Bayt. So rid them of spiritual filth and purify them thoroughly. One day, an angel came to the Prophet A Prophet said to Umm Salma, we have a guest, do not let anyone enter as we are having a conversation. In the meantime, Sayyidina Hussein, who at the time was very young, he enters the room and as children do, Sayyidina Hussein climbs on the top of the Prophet Sallallahu shoulder. And the angel said, do you love him? And the Prophet said, yes, of course. And the angel said, your followers will at a later time martyr him. Yeah. If you wish, I can show you where he will be martyred. And our Prophet said he would like to see where his grandson will be martyred. And the angel then brought some red soil and said, this is a place where he will be martyred. Our Prophet Islam took some soil from his hand and gave it to Umm Salma and she put it, the soil in a bottle. After this, it became known amongst the companions that Sayyidina Hussein would be martyred at a place called Karbala. Hmm. And our Prophet ﷺ told them that if any of them are present at the time, they should support him. We see that certain groups show love for Sayyidina Hussein and Ahlul Bayt and commemorate the martyrdom of Sayyidina Hussein, but will vilify some of the Ahlul Bayt and the Sahaba Kiram. Whereas the Ahlul Bayt showed their love to those whom these very groups Hate. The question to ask is, what was the relationship between the Ahlul Bayt and the other Sahaba, especially the Khulafai Rashidin? And Allah speaks about the Sahaba and the relationship with each. Muhammadur Rasulullah, walladhina ma'ahu ashidda'u ala al-kuffari ruhama'u baynahum. Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the messenger of Allah. And those with him, in other words, the Sahaba are stern against the Kuffar, yet they are compassionate amongst themselves. Based on this ayat, we understand the Sahaba had an excellent relationship amongst them. And the Nabi says, says, Allah, Allah, fi ashabi, Allah, Allah, fi ashabi, fear Allah regarding my companions, fear Allah regarding my companions. La tatakhiduhum ghardan ba'di. Do not make them objects of insults after me. فَمَنْ أَحَبَّهُمْ فَبِحُبِّي أَحَبَّهُمْ Whoever loves them, it is out of love for me that he loves them. وَمَنْ أَبْغَضَهُمْ فَبِبُغْضِي أَبْغَضَهُمْ And whoever hates them, it is out of hatred for me that he hates them. وَمَنْ آذَاهُمْ فَقَدْ آذَانِي وَمَنْ آذَانِي فَقَدْ آذَ اللَّهِ And whoever harms them, 
He has harmed me, and whoever harms me, he has offended Allah. وَمَنْ أَذَى اللَّهِ فَيُوشِكُ أَنْ يَأْخُذَهُ And whoever offends Allah, he shall be punished. You know, in the time of British-controlled India, the, the priests used to debate with the Muslims, and they used to bring them into huge stadiums and try to humiliate them and, and have this type. So one day, a, the, in this debate that was going on, a priest says, where is your prophet Muhammad now? And the Maulana says, he is in paradise with Almighty God. And then the priest says, where was he then when the grandson was butchered in Karbala? And the Maulana said, he was still in paradise. Mm. And the priest says, didn't he ask God for help when his grandson Sayyidina Hussein was being killed? And the Maulana paused for a while. Now the priest become, he became, became very impatient because he thought, I get no for you. Yeah. You know? So, and so the Maulana is also very clever, mashallah. He's playing the, the game now. And the priest says, come on, come on. Didn't he ask for help? And the Maulana says, yes, he did. And then the priest says, then what did God say? We know Sayyidina Hussein was not saved. Mm -hmm. What did God do? And the Maulana says, God cried. God had tears in his eyes. And the priest says, what? God cried. And the Maulana says, yes, God cried. And said to Prophet Muhammad, I could not save my only son, Jesus, on the cross. How could I still save your grandson? <laughs> Subhanallah. This is ilmul ladun. When Allah puts direct knowledge onto your heart to answer in situations when you find yourself that you are in. Subhanallah. You know, when Yazid came into power, there's so much to talk about, you know. He demanded the oath of allegiance from everyone. In other words, bay'ah. They want to and paying allegiance was an Arab tradition which was carried out in important matters, such as that of a rulership and authority. Yazid's message was delivered to Sayyidina Hussein as well, but he did not comply. Acknowledging Yazid's authority by the Prophet's grandson at this point would have meant acceptance of the Islamic leadership being mismanaged. And, and for Yazid, Sayyidina Hussein's seal of approval was the one most needed. So Yazid instructed the governor of Medina al Munawwara, Walid, to force Sayyidina Hussein to pledge allegiance. And Sayyidina Hussein refused and uttered his famous words Anyone related to me will never accept anyone related to Yazid as a ruler. And the people of Kufa were looking at Sayyidina Hussein for leadership. Soon there was a stream of letters coming in from Kufa urging him to challenge the leadership of Yazid and assuring him of their loyalty and allegiance. On certain days, there would be as many as 600 letters with messengers who enthusiastically described the support he would receive from the Kufans. Sayyidina Hussein decided to send his cousin, Muslim bin Aqil, to investigate the situation in Kufa. If he found it favorable, he should write to inform Sayyidina Hussein, who would depart with his family from Makkah to join him in Kufa. When the Kufans learned of his arrival, that is Muslim bin Aqil, they presented themselves to Muslim bin Aqil and gave their solemn pledge for Sayyidina Hussein with their lives and all they possessed. And when this number rose to 18,000, Muslim bin Aqil felt confident enough to dispatch a messenger to, Nabi, uh, to Sayyidina Hussein, informing him of the bay'ah of the Kufans, the Pledge of Allegiance, in other words, and urging him to proceed from Makkah. The governor of Kufa was the ruthless Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, who was regarded to be stern in confronting Hussein. Muslim bin Aqil was residing secretly in the house of Hani bin, ibn Urwa, realized that the hour for a decisive encounter had arrived. He gathered 4,000 of the men who had given him their oath of allegiance and loyalty to Sayyidina Hussein and proceeded towards the governor Ubaidullah bin Ziyad's fort. And when Ubaidullah saw Muslim bin Aqil with the Kufans at his gate, he sent some of the tribal leaders, leaders to Kufa to speak 
with their people, draw them away from Muslim and warn them of the wrath that would descend upon them when the, fam- when the armies from Damascus would arrive. Soon the mothers were telling their sons, come home. There are enough other people. And fathers were ominously warning their sons, what will happen tomorrow when the Syrian armies start arriving from Damascus? And gradually, shamelessly, they all deserted Muslim bin Aqil under the gates of the governor's fort. And at sunset, he was left with only 30 men. And before he knew it, he was all on his own in the streets of Kufa. Out of the 18,000 who but days before placed their hands in his, in his, in others in Muslim bin Aqil's hands, solemnly pledging allegiance to the cause for which they had invited the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Not a single one was there to offer Muslim bin Aqil the solace of their company. Muslim bin Aqil was captured and taken to Ibn Ziyad. Muslim bin Aqil knew his death was at hand and tears flowed from his eyes, not because of his own faith, but at the thought of Sayyidina Hussein and his mm-hmm. family is traveling through the harsh, merciless desert towards a fate much more harsher and merciless enemy, firmly resolved to bring an end to his venture and to the most treacherous of people who deserted him at the hour of need. He begged Ibn Ashad to send someone to Sayyidina Hussein with the following message. Ibn Aqil has sent me to you. He says to you, go back with your family. Do not be deceived by the people of Kufa. The Kufans have lied to me and have lied to you. And a liar has no sense. Later that day, the day of Arafat, the ninth of the Hijjah, Muslim bin Aqil was taken up at the highest ramparts of the fort and he was executed. And look at the, what happened. Muslims who gave pledge of allegiance, they pulled away. Doesn't that remind you of Palestine? Mm. Eh? We, shamelessly, we see them. The Arab Muslim leaders have left the Palestinians to their fate and the genocide that is taking place. Yes. The yes. same genocide that took, took place at Karbala is taking place today in Palestine and the Muslims are doing nothing. Yes, there are exceptions to the rule. Some people are doing something. But those that are immediate close to Palestine, they, as, as I'm saying, the, the, the Muslim leaders... Well, those who are in power. There are those that are in power. Mm. They are doing absolutely nothing. Mm. Shame on you. Absolutely. And absolutely. I ask Allah to make dua that Allah open up their hearts to see the plight of what is happening to the Palestinians. Because tomorrow it can, can happen to you. It can mm. happen to me. It can happen to us. Ya yeah, Allah, mm. Allah make it easy for them. And more so, at the time of Karbala, it was Muslims upon Muslims. Yes, yes. That's so sad. Cam- carrying on. The question is normally asked, if the people and the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu advised Sayyidina Hussein not to travel to Kufa, then why did he do so against their advice? And Imam Tabari and Ibn Kathir in his tafsir, they both write that the reason the companions of the Prophet told Sayyidina Hussein not to venture into Kufa was because they did not trust the inhabitants of Kufa. And they also believed that the time was not right to go and accept allegiance from the people of Kufa. However, Sayyidina Hussein decided to go to Kufa because he had seen the Prophet ﷺ in a dream. And the Prophet had given him the order to go to Kufa. You know, and there are so many uh, Incidences which I'm going to start extracting, like some of the incidences at Karbala, Karbala night, for example. Sayyidina Hussein and his companions passed the whole night in offering prayers, asking forgiveness from Allah and weeping. And before the passing away of Sayyidina Hassan, radiallahu an, he called Imam Qasim, in other words, his son, mm. and he gave him an azimat, a taweez, and asked him to tie it to his right hand and instructed him, whenever you are in severe problems and surrounded by difficulties, open this azimat, open this tawis, nikapsios ajumachi, you know, yeah. <laughs> and you will find a way out. Now in the Battle of Karbala, when Sayyidina Qasim, the son of Sayyidina Hassan, asked for permission to go into the battlefield, Sayyidina Hussein says, and he declined, and he says, you the beloved of my elder brother, and the only son, how can I give you permission? So after getting this negative answer, 
Sayyidina Qasim was very disappointed. He recollected, however, the words of his blessed father, and he opened the Tawis, which was on his right hand, or his wrist, given to his father, and he said, it said, you will be in Karbala surrounded by Kufar. Do take care of your uncle. After reading, he was very much delighted as he got permission from his father. So he headed towards Sayyidina Hussein and gave the letter to his uncle and said that my father has given me permission. Now please allow me to go to the battlefield. And on reading the letter, Sayyidina Hussein started weeping and finally gave permission to Sayyidina Qasim. And he fought bravely and finally he was martyred. When Sayyidina Hussein learned about the place was Karbala, he felt he reached the destination and he ordered now the, his camp to be set up. A division of the enemy's cavalry had been patrolling around Sayyidina Hussein's camp, and Imam Hussein was reciting the following ayahs loudly. وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ مَا نُمْلِي لَهُمْ خَيْرٌ لِأَنفُسِهِمْ and let not the disbelievers think that our postponing of their punishment is good for them. We postpone the punishment only so that they may increase in self sinfulness, and for them is a disgracing torment. Allah will not leave the believers in the state in which you are now mm. until he distinguishes the wicked from the good. Sayyidina Hussein and his companions spent the night in salah, in prayers. And during the night, Imam told the companions, the enemy is not interested in anyone but me, me alone. I'll be happy and I'll give you permission for each of you to go back. And I urge you to do so. All the companions screamed in response, Wallahi, Wallahi, never, never, we will either live with you or die together with you. Subhanallah, look at that commitment. Finally, the day of Ashura dawned upon the soil of Karbala. It was a day when jihad would be in full bloom, blood would be shed, 72 innocent lives would be sacrificed, and a decisive battle would be won to save Islam and the Ummah. It just had been a few days since the water supply was cut off by the enemy. Children were crying for water. The women were so desperate for water. Zainul Abidin, the son of Sayyidina Hussein, was sick with fever. The suffering from the thirst was too painful to bear. And despite this, not a single person in the camp made any complaints or even questioned the mission of Sayyidina Hussein. Each member supported the Imam wholeheartedly and enthusiastically. Sayyidina Hussein's supporters insisted on being the first to fight. Therefore, they took the brunt of the enemy attack. The battle was ferocious. Within a short space of time, Sayyidina Hussein's supporters killed a large number of the enemy fighters. They were on the offensive and the enemy on the defensive. This caused apprehension and confusion on the enemy military. 72 of Sayyidina Hussein's people against 5,000 of the enemy being on the defensive. The family and friends of Sayyidina Hussein eventually started falling one after the other. They were people of valor, welcoming martyrdom, and they fell one after the other. By noon, Imam Sayyidina Hussein stopped the, salah, stopped the fighting to perform salah. By this time, they left. Those that were left were mainly his family and a few supporters. They performed salah together. Two of the supporters were guarding the performers of the salah. To, to stand God, in other words. And when the Salah was finished, one of the gods fell dead with 17 arrows in his back. Yeah. Subhanallah. Ali Akbar, Sayyidina Hussein's son, obtained permission to fight and dashed towards the enemy. He engaged them in fierce fighting, falling on them like thunder, slaying numerous fighters. He continued to move forward deep inside the enemy. The enemy was overpowering in number. It overwhelmed him, cutting him with swords and spears, and his body became nothing but wounds gushing blood until he died. Sayyidina Hussein rushed to the area and picked up the wounded, limp body and brought it to the camp. His sister and others in the camp were horrified and shocked at the scene. Sayyidina Abbas went towards the river to bring some water for the thirsty children. While he was returning on his horse with the water, he was attacked by a large horde of the enemy, overwhelming and severely wounding him. As much as he tried, Sayyidina Abbas could not save the water. He fell from his horse and 
breathe his last. Next, the, when the sons of Sayyidina Hassan and Sayyidina Zainab and their cousins, there were 17 of them, they were all in their teens, but each stood bravely, believing in, the, in their mission, facing a formidable enemy and showed no less enthusiasm in their quest to end their embraced martyrdom. By the afternoon, most of Sayyidina Hussein's party had sacrificed their lives. All had fought under nerve-wracking conditions, severe thirst, dehydration, exhaustion, agonizing feeling of what should happen to the family of the Prophet afterwards. Sayyidina Hussein endured all that and more, for he saw all his beloved ones brutally cut to pieces, including the children. Remaining the only one, Sayyidina Hussein was to face the enemy now, head on, subhanAllah. At that moment, Sayyidina Hussein heard his baby crying incessantly because of the thirst. And Sayyidina Hussein's love for his family was unbound, especially for a suffering baby. He held a six-month baby, Ali Asghar, in his arms and appealed to the enemy fighters for some water. Sayyidina Hussein wanted to awaken their conscience and stir their human feelings. But the stone-hearted enemy, instead of giving water, they shot an arrow towards the agonizing baby, Ya Allah, and killed him instantly. Sayyidina Hussein was shocked. He felt an unbearable wave of pain. The sight of the limp baby in his arms was agonizingly painful. He filled his palm with the blood of the baby and threw it upwards towards the sky and complained to Allah, Oh Allah, my Rabb, my consolation is the fact that thou in thy majesty are witnessing what I am going through. Sayyidina Hussein was now alone. Eh? And yet he, he fought as bravely as he could. And then the silence. And although they were surrounding Sayyidina Hussein, but they were all too scared and cowardly to go forward to kill him. The silence was broken when Shimmer screamed an attack and then screamed again, threatening. And in response, they attacked collectively. One sword fell on Sayyidina Hussein's left wrist, deeply cut his left hand, and blood gushed forward. Another sword was soon to follow, and it hit his upper back. And Sayyidina Hussein felt numb as he fell to the ground, bleeding profusely. He was near the point of shock. Even though strag staggering, he tried to stand by leaning on his sword. It was at this point that Shimmer, whose mother was a kafir, came forward and severed the head of Sayyidina yeah. Hussein from the, his noble body. That same head which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam often kissed. Eh? Shimmer and others had the audacity to carry it on the tip of a spear to Yazid 600 miles away. Subhanallah. Umar ibn Sa'ad ordered the horsemen to trample upon the dead bodies of Sayyidina Hussein and all that were killed to disfigure them even further as if the wounds and the blooded bodies and the headless forms were not enough. Astaghfirullah. For three days, the exposed bodies of the martyrs were left lying in the desert of Karbala. Subhanallah. Afterwards, the people of Bani As'ad, who were not far away from the battlefield, they came to bury. Eh? At the forefront of the proces proces procession, as they were being led from Karbala to Kufa, was Sayyid uh, Hussein's, uh, with the heads on the tips of the, the spears. The, this is how they went to, to, to present them to Yazid. It was a very grotesque and gruesome scene. This was the leftover of the beloved family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Ahlul Bayt were held prisoners in Damascus for a year. And during this year, some prisoners died of grief. Most notably, Sakina bin Sayyidina Hussein. The people of Damascus began to frequent the prison. And Sayyidina Zainab and Sayyidina Ali bin Sayyidina Hussein used the opportunity to further propagate the message of Sayyidina Hussein and explain to the people the reason. And Imam Zuhri, rahimullah, states that of the people involved in the callous murder of Sayyidina Hussein and family, not one of them was spared. Each one was punished in this world. Some were killed, some became blind, some people's faces were blackened, some were burnt beyond recognition. This was not the actual punishment for the action. It was merely an example of what it was to come and to serve a lesson for people in this world. During the journey from Karbala to Kufa and from Kufa to Damascus, Sayyidina Hussein's sister, Sayyidina Zainab, subhanallah, and Um Kulthum gave various speeches. And I have, I've got so much to say still, you know. 
you must you should have heard the sermon of Sidna Zainab. Wow. And unfortunately I won't have the time to to repeat it. You know? And and what a talk, what a speech she gave. Wallahi, if we talk about women power. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's but goosebumps. And I'm sure Imam can point us to some, you know, Imam can, can I want to end some. off rather with Marcia. Marcia is the poetry lamenting the events of Karbala. And I dedicate the following Marcia to the people of Palestine and all the oppressed in the world. May Allah grant them relief, Ya Allah. I mean, and the poet says, Aake maqtal me zayna pukari bhai jati humai karbala se Ranjo gham se nihayat hu aari bhai jati humai karbala se Says, entering the execution field, Sayyidina Zainab says, Brother, dearest, I am leaving Karbala. Quite shocked and absolutely sad. Brother, dearest brother, Ya Allah. And one more. Bund pani ka tumne na paaya Ashqiya ne nihayat sataaya Ruh piyasi hi janna sidhari Bhai jati humai karbala se Sidna Zainab says, Not even a drop of water were you given. The callous ones have tormented you so much. Your soul departed to paradise in thirst. Dearest brother, I am leaving Karbala. And a different, a beautiful uh, Marcia. Shaheed Muazam, Imam Mukarram, Aishir Ali wa Fatima ke dulare, Zarurat hai phir aaj. Jo dunia ko teri ay insan azam Muhammad ke pyare O oh, greatest of martyrs, O oh, honored leader, O oh, favorite of Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidatina Fatima The world needs you even today, O oh, greatest of humans The love of Muhammad Sayyidina Hussein's name will echo in the annals of history for Allah says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ And never think of those who have been killed in the cause of Allah as dead. Rather, they are alive with their Lord receiving provision. فَرِحِينَ بِمَا أَتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Rejoicing in what Allah has bestowed upon them of His bounty. وَيَسْتَبْشِرُونَ بِالَّذِينَ لَمْ يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ And they receive good tidings about those to be martyred after them who have not yet joined them. Allah khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. That there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. And this ayat of the Quran so ap applicably is for the Palestinians as well. May Allah grant those fathers and mothers and children, and especially the parents who've seen their own children being killed and bombed in front of their own eyes. That genocide that happened in Karbala is this genocide million times more that is happening now even in Palestine. Oh Allah, I raise my hands with the barakah of this month and the day of 10th of Muharram, grant relief to Palestine and all the oppressed areas in the world and disgrace the oppressors, Ya Allah. And put, and I still say shame on those lead Muslim leaders who's, who, who's not doing anything. Oh Allah, I still make dua for them, open their hearts that they can do something. And I thank you, Radio 76, that I could share my heart with all of you. We are only, yeah, we're only sorry that we don't have more time. Uh, indeed, uh, Imam Hassan Walili, uh, it felt like we could, yeah, we could, we could listen to it. We could listen to that for, for hours and hours exactly because it's so important for us to remind ourselves okay. of these events of Karbala. I'm listening as, as Imam is saying how, how Imam Hassan, the beloved grandson of the Prophet, how he walked with his baby. And one thinks about these images that we see mm. of Palestinian mothers and fathers. One thinks about the denial of water. Yes, to the beloved progeny of the Prophet Sallallahu That water was cut off by Muslims. Yes. And then we look at what is happening in Palestine. Allah and Allah. 
So indeed, let these moments, let us be jolted and jarred. And when we think about this and we think about that this could happen to the beloved of the Prophet Sallallahu And so exactly it ought to be lessons for us as humankind. We've always just heard the history being read to us. And every night we go to the Majalis and hear the yeah. history. Today we are seeing that history. We're seeing it. In Really, because we have TV, phones, or whatever. And the, and, and the onus is on us. Are we going to be on the right side of history? Gosh. You know, are we going to choose sides uh, the way at the time as as Imam now said? Are we said, going to be like the Munafiks of Kufa? Exactly, right? exactly. Allah protect because our children and grandchildren. Ya Allah. Amin, amin, yeah. inshallah. Shukran so much for those few words. Imam Hassan Walili, he is the officiating Imam at the Phoenix Masjid. He's also a teacher in the Naqshabandi uh, um, uh, Tariqa among many, many, many other things and we say shukran to Imam. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.